coming today. We're very happy that you're all here. Uh, I'm Barbara Cullen with IPI. We are co-hosting this event um, with ITIF and Rob Atkins at the other end of the dive. We are co-moderating, so we kind of split up responsibilities. The people you're really here to, to listen to and to learn from are the folks between us, and Rob will be introducing them in a moment. A quick bit on ITI, we're a 25-year-old uh, public policy think tank. Uh, we started in the area of taxes and economics and have grown from that thought. And uh, the issues we take on all represent significant slices of the economy, such as healthcare, uh, technology, information technology, communications, intellectual property, and a couple others. Uh, so I agree to take a look at our website at IPI.org. Um, let's see what else is wrong. We're based in Texas. We're here very often. So if we can help you in any way, uh, let us know. I am. I'm frankly lucky, I said this on the phone, we had a phone call yesterday uh, when I get to these events because it's almost always like old home week for me. And literally everybody, everybody up here I have worked with um, as a colleague on some debate around these issues at some point in the past and some of this very day. So it's always very exciting for me to be here. To set a little bit of the stage and give a little more of my background, I was on Capitol Hill, I worked in the U.S. Senate uh, in 1994-1998. And it was during that time that the first internet tax moratorium was drafted by, uh, primarily by Senator Ron Wyden's office, but with John Ashcroft, the original Republican co-sponsor, uh, for whom I work. We, nothing happened in uh, that first iteration. There was concern about the way it was written, so it was rewritten in the next Congress um, in 97. It eventually passed in 1998. It was a very simple piece of legislation, or so we thought. Uh, here we are today still talking about it, and as you will learn uh, very shortly, all the issues that we discussed then are still relevant now uh, for any number of reasons. But the one important piece out of that piece of legislation that I'll mention is out of that legislation we formed a uh, congressional uh, commission, and the commission met for, I think it ended up being a year, and maybe a little bit, and put out a report back then. Um, we had all hoped that most of these issues would have been addressed by that commission. Some were, some weren't. But at the end of the day, not much past the full commission. And so the issues are still with us today. So I've been involved in this issue since about 1996. I'm going to pass more and on and on. I'm still involved today. So I have a passion for these issues. You guys must have been kind of interested to be here. So hopefully you're excited by these issues and the potential of these issues as well. The last thing I'll say is these issues uh, of which there are five to be addressed here, are frankly the ones that Rob and I chose. Uh, there, there might be others, but it struck us that these were the five that most often got confused in a big bucket called internet tax. And you'll often hear people name one of them, talk about the legislative language of a second one and the implications of yet a third. So our hope here is to present to you these five different proposals iconically represented by different people so that you can understand uh, and learn more in depth on each of those each of those topics. With that, Rob? Great, thanks, Mark. Uh, if I could ask folks to kind of, there's a seat up here, there's another one right up here. Seats in there, folks could, uh, could grab them and maybe a few other people. Apologize for the size of the room. So, um, so I just want to make a couple of quick comments uh, and echo what Mark has said. Uh, you know, in our interaction with folks on this issue, there, there is an enormous amount of confusion. Uh, people oftentimes, for example, confuse what's now become the Marketplace Fairness Act with the Internet Tax Moratorium. Isn't that the same thing? They're both dealing with Internet tax. What about this digital goods thing? Isn't that about things being sold on the Internet? And so we thought it was useful to just provide kind of, if you will, uh, an, an idiot's guide. Not that any of us are idiots, uh, but a policymaker primer, if you will, on, on these set of issues, as well as talk a little bit about our positions on them. We're releasing a report today with the really iconic title, A Policymaker's Guide to Internet Tax. And uh, I just want to go through a couple of quick uh, principles. And, and I think that's one of the key parts of this debate is really understanding what are the principles that we're trying to maximize. And in our view, there's four principles that we should be considering when we're thinking about internet tax. Uh, and one is that any tax should induce little change in consumer behavior. 
I, I was trying to do that uh, explicitly. For example, a, a carbon tax would be designed to change someone's behavior. But normally you try to have taxes that don't change people's behavior, that let sort of natural market forces and price forces uh, affect how people are going to make decisions. Uh, secondly, uh, we want to have a tax, ideally, that's not more disproportionately by low-income households. Third, we want to have a tax that's not placed disproportionately on, ex on ex activities with a positive externality. So again, if you think about that some activities in our economy have big spillovers, when someone does them, they're actually benefiting other people. Wireless use is a good example of that. When somebody engages in, 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 and adopts a wireless network for a subscription, they're not just helping themselves, they're helping the entire network through what's called Metcalf's Law. The network becomes bigger, it becomes more valuable to everybody because of one person is added to it. Uh, and the fourth principle should be that any tax should reflect what is being sold and not how it's being sold. So these taxes are not always, you can't always maximize all four, but I think we can try to get there on them. And in particular, we talk about four major areas uh, that are up in front of Congress right now. One is internet tax itself. In other words, taxing the internet activity, the ISP activity, if you will. We argue that that moratorium should be made permanent and that the grandfathering of states should actually be lifted. There are certain states that, that got in early on the game and benefit from it. Second is the Digital Goods and Services Tax Fairness Act, which pro prohibit uh, state and local governments creating multiple instruments for tax. And again, that's something we think is very important. Wireless Tax Fairness Act, uh, as Job will talk about, wireless uh, services are taxed at a much higher rate than saying, you know, buying a book at a bookstore or they're buying a pair of pants. Uh, and that, to us, is exactly the wrong thing. So we should be thinking strongly about passing something along that line. And the last is what's uh, has been now in this Congress, the Marketplace Fairness Act, which is essentially to level the playing field between bricks and mortar e-commerce retailers, uh, retailers as well as e-commerce retailers. So with that, uh, we've got a great panel. I'm going to just go down and introduce them very quickly. We're going to go in this order, and we should have plenty of time for uh, questions. I'm going to do very short uh, introductions. we we'll start, uh, start with Annabelle Canning, who's a partner at Capital Tax Partners, which is Washington's largest independent consulting firm specializing in tax and regulatory matters. Before coming uh, there, Annabelle was vice president for state tax policy at Verizon Communications. Uh, she's also previously served as Vice President and Legislative Council at the Council on State Taxation, which is a leading trade association representing large multi-state uh, businesses and state tax issues. Uh, next is uh, Joe Crosby. Joe is uh, also he's with, uh, the principal of Multi-State Associates. Joe also was with the Council of State Tax uh, Taxation, he was there for 11 years. Prior to that, he was the National Director of State Legislative Services for Ernst & Young. He's also past president of the State Government Affairs Council. Brian Baron is the Senior Director of Federal Affairs for eBay. Uh, he's been at that position since 2004. Uh, prior to that, he was the Director of Clark & Weinstock, where he was a leading advisor to tel telecom and tech associations. He also spent 12 years on the Hill, where he was policy director for House Rules Committee Chairman David Dreyer. Uh, next is uh, Steve Del Bianco. Steve is the executive director of Net Choice, which is a leading advocacy group for internet policy issues. Steve's a well-known expert on internet governance, online consumer protection, and internet taxation. He's also a, a one of the, I have to say, is one of the, the, the bad things that Steve has to do. He has to actually go to internet governance forums, which is probably the worst punishment anyone can have going to these insufferable long meetings in other countries where they talk about internet governance on China. So I, I give you a lot of credit for doing that. Uh, Steve also was a former president and founder of Financial Dynamics, which is an IT consulting and software firm. Uh, Maggie Lazarus is the attorney at the law office of John T. O'Rourke, which is a boutique law firm specializing in legislative and executive branch representation. She uh, represents firms on a variety of issues including tax, bank, and trade, IP, and IP. Uh, before joining uh, O'Rourke, she was a litigator in, uh, in uh, law practice representing the white world clients. And uh, last but not least is uh, John Carpenter. John is the Vice President of Government Affairs for the uh, uh, CTIA, uh, uh, which is the leading uh, trade association in the wireless industry. 
He, uh, before coming to CTIA, he, was been, he was at AT&T since 1996, was federal vice president, and prior to that, spent the three years uh, with uh, as assistant to Congressman Mike Oxley. So with that, uh, we'll start with Annabelle. And I did not have my question. Um, I first want to thank um, Rob and Bartlett for hosting this event. Um, because I'm the first off, I'm, and I'm talking about the Internet Tax Moratorium, I'm just going to give a little bit of background um, about the Internet Tax Moratorium. Um, it was first enacted back in 1998, and it's, uh, it was enacted as a three-year moratorium. Um, I'm going to go into a little bit of detail on what the moratorium did, but also going to refer back to what Bartlett mentioned, that it also, the other thing that it did was establish the advisory um, Commission on Electronic Commerce. The, the bill name is the Internet Tax Freedom Act, um, but it is commonly referred to as the Internet Tax Moratorium. As Parla mentioned, the um, advisory commission that was set up as part of that legislation uh, focused on a lot of different issues, including all of the issues that are going to be discussed up here today, including the remote sales, um, taxation of communication services, um, as well as the moratorium um, on taxation of internet access. Um, the focus of the internet tax moratorium, what I'll focus on today, um, was also covered um, in that, uh, with the, by the commission. Um, and in both the majority and the minority reports, they focused on the fact that um, the, mature, the moratorium should be extended until simplification occurs. And uh, as I will go into, with respect to the taxation of communication services, we still have not seen um, that simplification occur. Um, so just a little bit more on the history of the, morator of the Internet Tax Moratorium. Um, it was a three-year moratorium. In 2001, it was extended for two years. It was a simple, straight extension, two years. In 2001, uh, in 2000, and it was extended for, uh, it extended to 2003. Um, the was not extended again until 2004 because the process took quite a bit of time. Um, but it, the legislation um, that was the next extension um, that was enacted in 2004 and, and it amended the language um, to cover all forms of broadband internet access, all access to the internet um, through the changes that were made in 2004 are covered by the moratorium. Um, and uh, it was extended for four more years to 2007. And again, in 2007, there were some modifications from a lineup standpoint, and the moratorium was extended until 2014. So here we are in the 113th Congress, and the moratorium is up once again. Uh, it is due to expire in uh, November of 2014. So as far as um, what the moratorium does, it does two things. It prevents um, state and local taxation of internet access, that's the access you purchase from your wireless provider, your cable provider, or your telephone provider to access the internet. And the other provision, um, operative substantive provision in the bill, is that um, state and local governments cannot impose multiple or discriminatory taxes on um, e-commerce. So that's really all commerce uh, over the internet. And multiple goes to the concept of um, multiple jurisdictions can't tax the same transaction, and discriminatory goes to the concept that you can't have more taxation on something that is delivered over the internet, be it a digital download, or just something that's purchased uh, from a company online, um, than you have in the bricks and mortar mainstream type of world. Um, from a policy standpoint, um, this bill ensured uh, that the taxes on internet access remain low. I think it's a policy goal to ensure that there is access for all Americans at a low rate. Um, and the uh, other goal was really to um, encourage the growth of the internet. Now obviously what we've seen is not only the growth of the internet from a commerce standpoint, but really from the standpoint of, of individuals accessing for educational reasons, for job opportunities, small businesses use it to sell their goods all over the world today. So the, the other policy reason besides the economic growth engine that the internet has provided um, is that currently uh, other types of communication services that are sold at the same time with internet access are still subject to excessive rates of taxation. Um, studies document a rate, John will talk a little bit more about it, of 17% um, state and local taxation of voice type services and 12% of cable services. 
Um, protecting internet access from taxation means that when a consumer purchases some bundle of services, be it wireless voice and internet, or your cable uh, triple play, or your telecom triple play, um, that that effective rate of taxation is reduced. And because there is not been simplification and reform in the communications tax area, it's really critical to ensure that the moratorium stays in place to maintain more affordable access for all Americans to the internet. Thank you. Joe. Thank you, Robin Martin. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to be talking about the Marketplace Fairness Act, which has been introduced in the House as H.R. 684 and in the Senate as Senate uh, 336. A bipartisan set of co-sponsors, uh, much as was the case in the last Congress. The issue that addresses is, is fairly simple. The bill seeks to provide the states a pathway to ensure that legally owed taxes on remote sales are collected at the point of sale. Um, under current law, and many of you are familiar with the Quill decision, but I'll go through things uh, briefly here. Um, the Supreme Court said that sellers that did not have a physical presence in a state are not required to collect sales tax in that state. That sounds fairly straightforward, and we, we don't have time to get into it uh, in these initial comments, but physical presence itself is something that is not well defined. There are other Supreme Court cases, and it is unclear exactly uh, whether and to what extent affiliates and agency relationships create physical presence for an out-of-state retailer. So keep that in mind as you're thinking about this issue. Consumers remain liable for taxes that are not collected at the point of sale. Every state that has a sales tax has a corollary, which is the use tax. So in other words, when a tax is not collected at the point of sale, a consumer legally is required uh, to remit use tax to the state on those purchases. As we all know, and I won't ask for a show of hands, um, that frequently does not occur. Um, the issue of uncollected sales tax on remote sales far predates the internet, of course. Uh, it's not something that was created by the internet, and in fact, many sales that occur over the internet um, are not remote sales. Um, for example, Main Street retailers who have an internet presence frequently collect sales tax, uh, always collect sales tax in the states in which they have a presence, and frequently collect sales tax across the country. So I think it's important to understand that the fact that a sale takes place over the internet doesn't necessarily make it a remote sale. Remote sales are a subset of internet transactions. Similarly, there are a lot of transactions that occur outside of the uh, internet, which are also remote sales. And, and so although this is a relationship to the internet, it's not, we're not exclusively talking about the internet. The reason the internet comes into play so in such a large way when we're talking about these types of transactions is because the internet uh, has facilitated dramatic growth in the, in the amount of remote sales. Going back to the Quill decision in 1992, Sales that are transacted in a store have increased about 127% according to U.S. government data. Sales that take place outside of a store have increased about 450%. And the delta between those is increasing. And so that's why for uh, Main Street retailers, for state and local governments, and for others who are interested uh, in this issue, the fact that those sales taxes are not collected uh, at the point of sale uh, is a significant problem. The internet certainly has been a boon for business, it's been a boon for consumers, and it's been a boon for the economy overall. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately though, because of federal law, because of the Quill decision, there is a tax preference uh, for those who are selling over the internet or, or making remote sales. Uh, and that tax preference varies depending on the jurisdiction in which you live. On average across the country, it's about 6.5%, but can be as high as 13% or even more in some local jurisdictions. And what I mean by that is that if you, you transact, you take the transaction on the internet, if you choose not to remit your use tax, uh, then you get a price discount of somewhere you know, between, uh, between 4 and 13%, depending on the jurisdiction in which you live. Um, some would suggest that this price disadvantage is no different and, and compensates for the fact that those who sell over the internet have other costs, such as shipping costs. I frankly find those arguments nonsensical. Other costs associated with the business model are made as a result of the free market by investors and by business managers. This is something that directly results from federal tax policy. It is a preference, and I use that in a factual basis, not pejorative. Uh, it gets called a loophole or other sorts of things. It's undeniable, though, that it is a preference for those sorts of sales. Uh, and that preference does have an impact in the marketplace. The solution to this, and which is what is incorporated within the Marketplace Fairness Act, is to authorize states, under certain circumstances, to require remote sellers above a certain threshold to collect those taxes. 
There's a few components of this which I'll just briefly get into. Um, there is no principled legal or economic argument that would suggest that transactions over the internet are different in some way than transactions that occur elsewhere. Uh, if you're buying an item of clothing in a store versus on the internet, no one has put forth an economic or legal argument that those, tax, those transactions on the internet should some, for some reason be exempt. What the Supreme Court put forth was a practical problem, that the multiplicity and diversity of state sales tax regimes constituted an undue burden on interstate, com on interstate commerce. The Congress, though, has plenary authority under the Commerce Clause to set the rules for interstate com commerce, and in fact, that's exactly what the Quill Court said. Uh, and so what the bill does is provide a set of criteria, simplifications that states would have to adopt, protections for remote sellers, and then technology that um, that states would have to provide to remote sellers to facilitate collection of the tax. And we can get into some of those more on Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And um, uh, thank you, Joe, for a really thoughtful presentation. Um, the long form of this is going to be on Thursday where we're going to do the deep dive, where we can go actually into concepts like due process and purposeful availment and what the Quill decision actually says on these important legal issues. But while I don't usually work from notes, I'm going to do that today because I want to stick to my time. First off, as Joe said, um, the bills at hand do not create a new internet sales tax, and there's no internet loophole being closed. Current law does not treat retail on the internet any differently than catalogs or retail in stores. States have always had the power to require retailers to collect and remit sales tax if the retailer has a presence in the state. They also have the power to require citizens to pay their use taxes. They also have the power to give special tax breaks to businesses, by the way, in their state. Um, and states have essentially always wanted to expand their sales collection, sales tax collection powers beyond their borders. What the bills would create is a new national scale state sales tax collection regime. States would finally be granted the power to enforce their sales tax laws beyond the border. The bills are about tax enforcement, plain and simple. This is a question of tax enforcement power in the internet age. All states, as, I, as we said, can enforce their sales tax laws and their use tax laws in state. There's no question about that. What they cannot do is require an out-of-state business to collect and remit sales taxes. This issue comes down to that simple change. Give power, a new state power, to enforce sales tax laws on out-of-state businesses, a power that is today prohibited by Supreme Court decisions. Collection authority sounds boring, more boring than internet taxes, but it actually turns out that people across America are more opposed to a new grant of power to states to, and their tax collectors to enforce power outside their borders than they're actually concerned about new taxes. We actually handed, we have a poll for them on the handout it actually shows that it's significantly more unpopular to essentially unleash state tax collectors beyond the borders. Every retail business, the third point is every retail business, including the largest retailers, all use technology, internet, mobile, and they all have some form of physical presence. The, the, the continued use of like internet versus Main Street, you know, is ridiculous. We all go shopping, you know, that all the large store networks, they all are very successful internet retailers. Every retailer behind the campaign is a major internet retailer. And, and every retailer has to put their stuff somewhere, no matter how small. There's somewhere, they're in a state. Internet retail doesn't come from the moon. They're all employing people somewhere. They're all in a community somewhere promoting economic growth. By the way, 18 of the top 25 internet retailers are the large brick and click retailers who combine their stores and their websites. Fourth, Every retailer in America lives under the same laws, and they've known these laws for decades. The, the, the law has been consistent, and large retailers have chosen to combine their stores and their websites anyhow. They choose the combination that results in the tax collection burden. Likewise, when retailers put distribution centers in states to get closer to their customers, they know that that's supposed to bring tax obligations. Doesn't always bring it. Sometimes states give special breaks, but it's supposed to bring it. These business decisions are a clear market signal that the system is relatively balanced. If sales taxes was more of a negative than the value of having the presence locally, retailers wouldn't put their presence local to deal with this issue. Fifth, 
We've never said that this issue is about complexity or compliance. There are some who would like to talk about that because that's what they would like the issue to be. First off, nobody agrees whether or not there are real tech solutions to this thing. And plenty of small businesses will come and talk about how they get promised free software solutions and it doesn't work. Second, there is a whole cottage industry of folks who want to offer this service, but they need the law to be changed to actually create a market. So that's their business model, lobby for change. The reason why we have opposed this is because it's small retailers with the most limited presence that will be hurt the most and we believe that any change in the law should not harm the small business. So what are the actual internet tax issues revolving around sales taxes? Because we've agreed it's not actually about sales tax on the internet. Due process, the power of government, state power in relation to other states, taxation without representation. These are all questions that are now raised in the context of what do they mean in the internet age? If the U.S. Congress erases this black and white physical presence standard in our tax law in the name of the internet, what does that mean about tax power overall in the internet? Does getting online mean any business is present in every jurisdiction everywhere? Because we know the internet goes everywhere. And if the answer is yes, if they have presence everywhere at that point, there are real consequences. Consequences for due process, consequences for where does this state power end if orders don't matter on the internet, then that's a significant issue that policymakers ought to look at. By the way, when a small business gets sued by a state that's a thousand miles away, there's no app for that. Great. Thanks, Brian. Uh, thanks, Ronald and Bartlett. My topic is the taxes on digital goods and digital services. So it's not as controversial as I think what Brian and Joe have talked about. But I think it's every bit as confusing. So what's the deal with digital goods and taxes. To tell you a true story, I'm a resident of Virginia. The other day I bought a $24 um, audio book from audible.com while sitting in my office here in the district. I downloaded the first part, it's a two part, downloaded the first part of my iPad at O'Hare Airport between flights, downloaded the second part when I landed in Los Angeles on my iPhone, and uh, it was, both downloads came from servers in Texas, and they were both provided to me through uh, Verizon's LTE service. Question, who gets to tax, sales tax on my purchase? Is it D.C., Illinois, California, Texas, or Virginia? Hold your, hold your answer. Because what we've got here is a perfect storm, again, on digital goods taxes. First, we have innovation in mobile devices and cloud services coming from providers. We have consumer preferences for mobility and consumer preferences to have all their stuff just sort of stored in the cloud. And then finally, states are really getting aggressive and creative and trying to tax digital activity. A couple of examples. Tax administrators love to say that there are digital equivalents to tangible personal property. And if we already tax the tangible personal property, we ought to tax the digital equivalents. So if we tax doorbells, I guess we ought to be taxing the ringtones you download for your phone. Right? The same thing. iTunes and iMovies and ebooks, are they the equivalent of their books? Well, you know, not really. I can't give away my ebook. I can't lend you my iTunes, and I can't sell my automobile that I pulled down. None of those things are transferable under the license agreements. They're completely different than the physical counterparts I could buy in a bookstore or a music store. Now, some states say that you're delivering an e-document as part of an online service. That creates a taxable event. So if I get a document from a guy who's helping me draft a will, I guess that becomes tangible personal property. It would make that service taxable. I said a will. I guess with this crowd, I should say getting someone to edit a resume creates a tangible event. So together, all these forces are driving the need for Congress to act. And in the 112th Congress, we had the Digital Goods and Services Tax Fairness Act of 2011. It was in the Senate by Senators Biden and Thune. And there was a hearing last April on the Senate Finance. And in the House, it was H.R. 1860, Representative Smith, Cohen, Coble, and Hastings. And there was a judiciary hearing in the House in May of 2011. Rob Atkinson was one of the witnesses there. So this same bill is coming soon to the 113th Congress, too, with some adjustments. There's key elements in this congressional legislation that are still the same. It's not about determining when a business has to collect, which was Brian and Joe's topic. It's based on authority that's exclusively given to Congress in the Constitution, Article 1 of the Congress Clause. And three, the bill says, quote, no state or local jurisdiction shall impose multiple or discriminatory taxes on or with respect to the sale or use of digital goods and digital services. Different than what Annabelle talked about, which is your monthly bill for your online internet access. That's what that moratorium is about. This is about 
the buying of digital goods and services. Now, the rest of the bill is details, and I know that's what you guys are into, but I'll give you a couple of the highlights. It clarifies sourcing. It says in this bill that one state gets the right to tax. Which state is it? The state where the purchaser lives, where their billing address. So, uh, in the example I gave, it was my state of Virginia. And it turns out that Virginia, and Delia Brink is here from Virginia the legislature, Virginia doesn't actually tax ebooks, so there's a happy ending for me there. Number two, the bill clarifies that only the state legislature can impose a new tax on digital downloads or services. So the tax administrators alone can't sort of dream up a digital equivalent in order to create some new tax that wasn't enacted by the legislature. Three, it prevents states from imposing discriminatory taxes on digital goods so they can't tax an iTunes at a higher rate than a CD you buy from the store. Now, this also stops states from trying to jam state and local telecom taxes on top of the things that are delivered digitally, and John's going to cover some of that later on. And lastly, it prevents multiple taxes by requiring a state to give you credit for a tax you pay to another jurisdiction. So if a state were to follow the rules in Congress's bill, they still question that before the states is should they enact taxes on digital goods, even if they follow all these rules. Well, states that move fast and first are creating a first mover disadvantage because uh, they would end up hurting only the businesses in their state because failing the overturning of the Quill decision, only businesses in their state has to collect. Ronald Atkinson made some great arguments last year about the national interest of not taxing digital goods, considering that 2% of our uh, economy is the internet. And then uh, the greenest way, I have to say, the greenest way to get your music, movies, books, and games, and software is to do digital download. It's got far less uh, carbon footprint and natural resource consumption than driving to the store and throwing away all that plastic and packaging. So uh, one other thing to think about is, is that why penalize those customers who are paying for their music as opposed to those who are stealing it. So Bartlett had asked about arguments against, and there aren't too many arguments against, other than the fact that administrators and state tax departments would prefer the discretion to create new taxes out of whole cloth without the sort of restrictions and strictures that are in this bill. So the coalition behind this is called Download Fairness, but fairness has become sort of a meaningless term in this town. Still, it's a little easier on the tongue than what I wanted to call it, which was StopDumbDigitalTaxes.org. Thank you. Well, Steve, I think maybe the, the answer is we should impose a, no, no, we can pass a digital uh, services, uh, goods and services tax, and we should then impose a tax on all pirated uh, downloads. Only those, sir. Only those. Good luck to Maggie. Good afternoon. My microphone's working, so I'll just try to talk loudly. Uh, my firm represents the Coalition for Interstate Tax Fairness and Job Growth, which is a group of company and trade associations that are working for enactment of a federal bill to address the issue of business activity tax nexus. Um, I think our issue is most frequently confused with the sales tax issues by Joe and Brian, but unlike sales and use tax, ours relates only to uh, corporate income-based taxes. Um, at its most basic, the issue involves the question of what kind of connection a state needs to have with a company to be allowed to assess income-based taxes on that business. Um, traditionally, companies understood that uh, restrictions imposed by the Commerce Clause required that the taxpayer have a physical presence in the taxing jurisdiction. That could be an employee, real estate, or inventory, with the theory being if you are physically present in a state, you're enjoying the benefits and protections of the state, and so you should contribute to paying for them. More recently, however, some states have attempted to push the boundaries of the traditional nexus standard, advocating a theory that they call economic nexus which holds if you have customers in our jurisdiction, even if you have absolutely no physical presence in the state, we can tax your income. Um, some ways that this has manifested itself are, for example, with larger businesses, um, financial institutions that issue credit cards to consumers in a state where they have no physical presence and that state attempts to tax their income. Or broadcast companies transmitting programming into a jurisdiction where they have no employees or property. Um, but it doesn't only happen to large businesses. Increasingly, small businesses uh, are being assessed tax based on economic nexus theories. And it can be particularly devastating to companies that operate with much smaller margins. Uh, the issue of the constitutionality of economic nexus is unresolved. 
the issues heavily litigated, at least by larger companies that can afford litigation. Um, and the state Supreme Courts that have heard the issue are split on whether or not it violates the Commerce Clause. And the Supreme Court, although it's been petitioning many times uh, to review the issue as thus far, declined sir, um, indicating that they would prefer Congress to resolve the matter. Uh, the coalition believes that the appropriate solution to the business activity tax nexus issue is the Business Activity Tax Simplification Act. Um, on the House side, the longtime co sponsors of the bill are Representatives Goodlatte and Scott, and jurisdiction falls in the Judiciary Committee where the bill enjoys broad bipartisan support. The bill has not been introduced yet in this Congress, but we've been told by our co sponsors that we can expect that it will be dropped this spring. Um, on the Senate side, jurisdiction is with the Finance Committee, and our longtime uh, lead co sponsors there are Senator Schumer and Craig Bell. The bill does basically two things. First, it uh, clarifies that the appropriate nexus standard for state taxation of non-resident business income is fiscal presence. And second, it attempts to set forth a bright line uh, definition of what is fiscal presence. So the bill says that uh, a company has fiscal presence in a jurisdiction if it has one or more employees in the state, an exclusive agent in the state, or if it leases or owns tangible personal property or real property in the state for more than 14 days in a tax year. That allows for some de minimis presence in the state, but we think it um, basically allows states to capture all uh, taxation on all income producing activity that occurs within the borders. Um, enactment of the bill would ensure fairness. Uh, minimize costly litigation and create uh, legal certainty in the kind of stable business environment that businesses need in order to make investments, create jobs, and grow the economy. Um, thanks for your time and take, look forward to questions after everyone's done. Great, thank you. Scott. Well, first, let me thank Bartlett and Rob for inviting me to, to join you today. And uh, while I'm here just to talk about the Wireless Tax Fairness Act, I do want to associate myself with the comments made by Steve and Annabelle because those bills are also very important to CTI's membership. Uh, with respect to the Wireless Tax Fairness Act, it's a very simple bill that pr uh, proposes a five year moratorium on new discriminatory taxes on wireless service. And the reason we think that's important goes back in part to what Bartlett talked about at the very beginning of the presentation, uh, after the first internet tax moratorium was enacted, the Commission on Electronic Commerce met for about a year and a half and produced a series of recommendations which were aimed at trying to give us a tax system that made sense in an increasingly information-driven economy. That commission met in 1999-2000. In, uh, in the readout it produced in, in the spring of 2000, it said one of the things that needs to happen to update our 20th century telecom tax system to prepare ourselves for the information age is we need to eliminate discriminatory taxes <coughs> on wireless service and, and other telecommunications services. Telecommunications, going back to the days of Ma Bell, have traditionally been taxed at significantly higher rates than other goods and services. And we want to work at curing that problem and to demonstrate in, in sort of the uh, theme of the week how severe that problem is, I'll just share with you sort of the four, four first seeds in the uh, telecom tax uh, tournament. Uh, Nebraska is our first seed uh, with a, a combined state and local rate of nearly 19%, which is compared to a state uh, sales tax rate of just 7%. Uh, our second seed is Washington at 18.6 compared to a state, state sales tax rate of 9%. New York's at 17.85 compared to a sales tax rate of 2.5%. And Florida at 16.5% compared to a sales tax rate of 7.25%. If we had the state, state sales tax rate applied to wireless, we'd have no complaint. I wouldn't be sitting here today. Uh, but in each of those cases, you see we're taxed at uh, twice the rate of other goods and services. And so the wireless tax moratorium is intended to take a time out while we stop making the problem worse and, and begin engaging the states in a serious discussion of how do you cure this problem. We need to cure this problem because the Congress, the Commission, the administration have all said 
broadband adoption and deployment are national priorities, well, obviously, if you're taxing that input uh, at a, a significantly discriminatory rate, you're making it harder to achieve that goal. So we want to engage the states in a process that uh, unwinds these sort of 20th century rates, moves towards something that makes sense <coughs> in an information-driven economy. Uh, we think it's good policy. The House agreed with us in the last Congress when uh, uh, Congresswoman Loftrin and Congressman Trent Francis' bill was approved by the House by voice vote. We had about 20 co-sponsors on a bill in the Senate. Unfortunately, the Senate didn't take it up, so we'll be back at it in this session. We look for those bills to be dropped sometime, probably in the April-May work period, and look forward to, uh, to trying to make progress on, on that front in this Congress. Uh, with that, I promise Rob I wouldn't talk over my limit so we can get to Q&A, and I'll uh, hand Thank the time you. back. Yeah, one thing I don't think you did mention is uh, this, counts, this tax is on the data plans as well. It, it is on uh, all wireless service, including the data plan, and as the wireless device becomes increasingly the on-ramp to the internet for a significant chunk of the population, it does make it harder and more expensive for a significant portion of the population to afford to participate fully in the internet economy. Another benefit to, to curing this problem is to fix that. So maybe, Bartlett, before I turn it back to you to lead us in discussion, I just have thought, since uh, there was a slight, perhaps, a difference of opinion, uh, between Brian and Joe. I think maybe Joe, if you want to have just a couple of comments in return, and then we can basically what you heard from Brian and get any thoughts and response. Sure. Thank you, Rob. Uh, it's actually gratifying after his partner of doing this for more than 15 years that we've gotten to a point um, where there's there's no real disagreement that this is about tax collection, not about tax on the internet, and that there's no principled objection um, to requiring collection from remote sellers. What, what I heard Brian raise as a concern uh, is the impact this may have on small business, and I think it's important to perhaps discuss that a little bit. Um, the legislation provides a threshold below which uh, businesses would not be required to collect, and what the bill has said is if a business has uh, less than one million across the country, they would not be required to collect. And just to put that in a little bit of perspective, uh, Economist Inc. did a study that estimates 99.85% per, of all e-commerce sellers fall below that one, thousand, that $1 million threshold. Uh, in other words, they estimate that there are only 7,500 e-commerce sellers in this country that exceed that. So I think it's important with regard to small businesses to know that the bill uh, already exempts um, well beyond the overwhelming majority of, of small businesses. And for those that are above the threshold, it provides uh, significant simplifications and protections along uh, with the provision of free software um, to minimize the cost of collection. And just to give you an idea about that, uh, both Amazon and eBay now have programs to help their sellers collect, to calculate, collect, and remit taxes. Uh, and if, in some circumstances, they provide those free of charge uh, to some of their, what I'll call pro-sellers or higher-end sellers. Uh, there are third-party software solutions for this as well. Um, those solutions currently are able to provide um, retailers with collection at 25 to 50 basis points. So in other words, a quarter to 50 cents per $100 uh, of transaction, I would expect as, um, as these simplifications come into being, and as the, as the market for these certified software providers is, is national, uh, that they will be able to further drive down the cost. So, uh, great job, everybody. What, what I enjoy most is virtually everyone started off with a one sentence description of what the tax you were talking about, what it affected, what it didn't affect. Uh, would it be helpful for everybody if we just went down the road one more time and they just gave that first sentence? Would that help? Yeah, okay. So, Annabelle, let's start with you and just kind of the one sentence that y'all started with, it affects this and to some extent, I think Steve, you actually separated out and said it does not affect that, but how do you guys explain? Right, so um, it protects internet access. So when a consumer has a triple play type of purchase, they're purchasing voice, that may be wireless voice as was discussed by Jot, tax at these very high rates that were discussed by Jot. Um, video service, um, and then an internet access service. And that internet access is protected from these very high rates that are tied to the historic sort of monopoly status of these industries. Um, though the internet access is protected, and I think going to um, Rob's um, earlier point on behavior and rationale, you don't want excessive rates imposed on a internet access, which is providing consumers access to the internet, um, because that will discourage adoption and access to the internet. The second prong is a also a no multiple or discriminatory taxation of e-commerce. 
is similar to the digital goods bill, but it covers all commerce over the internet. And then I'll ask you one quick follow-up question, because frankly, I don't remember anymore, and it might be too many for you to remember. There are several states that have been grand grandfathered in a bunch of different ways. Do you remember what states are? So in other words, if you guys are hearing from constituents, you might hear, wait a second, I'm from Texas. In Texas, they are allowed to tax up to the first $25. Uh, and there are a bunch of these kinds of exceptions. So just so people don't get confused when they hear from the city and say, wait a second, I'm already paying tax on their access. Do you have to know what states those are? Yes, um, I hope I can remember. There are eight states. Um, the, Sorry, actually, please. a couple of them since, uh, I, I think some of them have actually clarified over the last couple of years. But um, it, it includes um, uh, Hawaii, New Mexico, North Dakota, South Dakota. In Ohio, it's just business. They can be taxed, no, uh, can, no residential access, consumer type access. Texas has an exemption, as Bartlett mentioned, for the first $25. And the remaining two are Washington and Wisconsin. Great, thank you so much. Now, uh, Joe and Brian, you guys talked about the same issue. And I think in your very first couple sentences, you guys totally agreed on what it was about. So I don't care whichever one of you wants to say what it is and what it is. Sure, the, the Marketplace Fairness Act simply provides the states a pathway to ensure that sales taxes are collected at the point of transaction. What it does not do, it does not change the underlying taxability of any of those transactions. It still remains up to the states whether or not to tax uh, something and what rate to impose. And Brian? Well, as we've had a couple of folks up here have talked about physical nexus and what that means for tax policy, the, the Marketplace Fairness Act grants, after many decades of effort, states the power to enforce their sales tax laws on businesses that are out-of-state businesses that have no physical presence, no direct nexus with those states. And um, yeah, that's what it does. It's about out-of-state tax collection. Okay. The Digital Goods and Services Tax Fairness Act is in response to not uh, who must collect, but which states may tax the things we do online, the digital goods and digital services. <coughs> It's uh, founded in the constitutional power given to Congress to control interstate commerce. And it does three things. It clarifies sourcing to say that only one state gets to tax the digital goods and services. It's the state where the purchaser has their billing address. Number two, it clarifies that only a state legislature can create brand new taxes on digital goods and services. That means it can't be done by a tax administrator trying to find some equivalence with an old tax law. And third and finally, it uh, prevents discriminatory taxes on digital goods and services to where they're taxed at a much different rate than a similar item that's not purchased through a download. And maybe? Uh, the business activity tax nexus issue uh, implicates state taxes that are calculated based on corporate income. That could be obviously corporate income taxes, but some states um, uh, instead impose, for example, franchise taxes or gross receipt taxes. It does not impact at all sales and use taxes. Um, and it, the, the legislation addresses only the threshold question of the appropriate constitutional nexus standard that gives the state authority to impose its tax on a non-resident business. It does not touch um, any way that the state wants to structure a tax, its taxes, the percentage that it charges, or or how it um, organizes its, its uh, tax regime. And no. Wireless Tax Fairness Act, we call a simple five-year timeout on new discriminatory taxes on wireless services. Great. OK, so we have 35 minutes. So we have time for several questions. Um, and because you were quickest to the buzzer, you can ask her a question. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been maybe, uh, more of a naive question, but to cross these various tax regimes that seems it's predicated on disparate state regimes of taxes, why I declare the online market, digital market, as a, as a national market, have a national, in essence of that, but it's still a modality of state income taxes, and then collect those fees that wouldn't stop shopping and Put into the fist. I don't know who else addressed that, Brian. You see me here? Well, yeah, no, I'll speak up and say that that would actually address a lot of the very appropriate legal and policy concerns involved here. That there's no question that the Congress would have the authority to do that and could head down that path. This effort to allow states to get into power and <coughs> the internet 
is, is, is actually sort of a jerry-rigged kind of way to get at something like that without the states actually giving up any authority, which they haven't wanted to do. But yeah, you had a great point. It's preempted. <laughs> Free eBay, I mean, it's got to have a second clause that says that in re to replace all the state and local taxes. And that would be the part that would somehow fall off in reconciliation. <laughs> <laughs> thing that you could, uh, that you could t discuss in the context of that idea is that every um, tax treaty to which the U.S. is a signatory um, includes a concept of permanent establishment, which essentially is a physical presence nexus standard. It's actually a little bit um, more strict than the physical presence nexus that we're talking about here. Um, so there are international implications for creating a totally boundaryless marketplace. I just to take moderator for I think one of the problems with that idea is that states have very different approaches to how they get their tax revenue. Some rely on sales tax a lot, some have no sales tax or very small sales tax, and there are different rates and all. One of the I think the advantages of what we can do today relative to twenty years ago is we, software is essentially the, the mass customization of the new world we're living in. And software solutions allow you to essentially have that national system, if you will, but with different rates. But as a business, then I have to disperse out all that money to various states. Well, you don't. Know, there's often one. one, 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 one no, I have to say that. I couldn't resist. Right. I, I would just say, look at what's happening in the states right now. Uh, there are almost 10 governors, most Republican, who are looking to eliminate or reduce their income taxes by expanding their sales taxes or raising their sales tax rates. And, you know, every economist would tell you it's preferable to have a consumption tax like the sales tax. What you're suggesting really is to play, replace the state consumption tax with a national consumption tax, right? It, it formulated in a different way. Um, I would submit that that's probably beyond the scope of this panel and beyond the scope of this Congress, but that would be for other short term. And uh, you know what else, too? If you were to do it back, it would probably need to discuss the elephant in the room, which is that sales taxes on tangible stuff is a tiny fraction of the actual activity of the economy. So inevitably, something we never talk about is that sales taxes are rarely imposed on services in a service economy. Only four states tax services. More states want to, and they're trying to sneak it in by calling it a delivery of a document that creates a service. But if you're going to do a VAT discussion, not only preempt the states, but it, it probably ought to discuss the coverage of more than just tangible personal property. Right. For example, eBay would have to then pay VAT on the charges it imposes on its own sellers. What? No, no. And let me say again that states that do tax services, for example, the state of South Dakota, they do uh, charge a sales tax on the fees that eBay charges to sellers in South Dakota, although eBay doesn't have a presence in South Dakota, and therefore those are collected via enforcement against the in-state business. You know, again, physical presence matters, and when you start to spin all these issues forward onto the internet, where at the end of the day, services are most easily provided cross borders, if you get rid of the authority of government, to be restrained by borders, where does that end? You know, Maggie mentions the concept of permanent establishment in our in our treaties. I, I find it ironic that there are a lot of businesses in this town who, whether they care about physical presence in the context of business activity taxes, or they care about physical presence in the context of the taxes that they might pay in other parts of the world, and they want to go to a territorial system to bring those funds back into this country, that you know they're perfectly happy to trade off for getting rid of a physical presence standard for really small retailers who are using the internet to sell cross-border and to sell globally. But all of these issues get really complicated if you think that it's just a question of software. But it's not a question of software when you get sued. You know, then you got to go to court, and what these bills all boil down to is the small business in Idaho has to go to court in New York State. Okay. So, no, no more really good questions from the audience. There's <laughs> cutting those off. I need very discreet, simple yes no questions, please. Oh, right. Good right, sir. Right. <laughs> Brian Brown, thank you for uh, putting this together for a great discussion. Joe, you were talking about companies being taxed up to about a million dollars. Wouldn't a business owner like me just say, when I get up to nine, 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 I'll just start another company and therefore, or another division, and therefore never have to pay that? So I have 125 million dollar company. Right, so one, one clarification is that um, 
the, the, the consumers ultimately who pay the tax, we're talking about collections, Brian indicated. Each state has a different regime and they call it different ways, but ultimately all the taxes are passed through the consumer. Um, the, the bill, of course, anticipates your argument includes aggregation rules is, is common under the Internal Revenue Code, so that doesn't really work. Um, uh, but the reality is it provides uh, significant simplifications and even protections. Brian talked about being sued in another state. It provides liability protections for sellers uh, along with the software so that if a seller uses the software provided by a state, uh, that, it's, that it's essentially outcome for liability unless, unless they've done something fraudulent or that they uh, have um, not made an error but gone beyond a civil error because all the calculation is done by the software. I'll finish and then you can talk. Um, the other thing about physical presence, um, the bill is actually very clear about that. It says nothing in this act should be construed as subjecting a seller, etc., to any franchise income, occupation, or any other type of tax affecting the application of such tax and largely reducing state authority. It's very clear, and this is what the Congress says, as Steve said, Article 1 provides Congress exclusive authority to regulate commerce. What the bill does is an exercise of that Commerce Clause authority to say, notwithstanding nexus, Businesses and courts, you can continue to fight over what the appropriate rule is under the Commerce Clause. Notwithstanding that, we're going to say for sellers who have over a million dollars in remote sales, you must collect tax in these states if the states meet these criteria. It's fairly straightforward. I, I appreciate Joe reading what I call the don't look at the man behind the curtain clause that's actually in their bill. You know, if, if your bill doesn't have a major problem, with the precedent that it's setting regarding nexus, you don't have to put a provision in that said, please ignore this bill for all of the businesses out there who care about nexus because none of this is going to cover that. Well, the reality is that there's no question that the precedent of the U.S. Congress wiping away what is the best, most black and white physical presence test in the tax code right now is going to have implications in the courts. It's going to have implications internationally. Um, it's, it's clearly bad policy, otherwise you don't have to put a provision in that says, everyone else in business, please ignore this. This is just to go after really small retailers. Um, yeah, no, I, can, I can say anything. Yeah. I'm just making noises. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 yeah, so, so the other half. Prepared, I'm following you so, so the other half <laughs> is that what I think I'm hearing Joe say is that, is, is that the bill does not address nexus slash due process issues. And so, I mean, if, if that's true, which actually I think would be a really great thing to sort of get on, onto the table, then that really does go to show that what this bill doesn't, it really doesn't grant, I guess, the authority, which, again, we would hope that it doesn't grant this authority, that um, really small retailers who use, who use the internet to put stuff up on the internet, that, that they're not, that they don't have presence in all these states, and that there still would be a due process bar to those folks being harassed. But the software, you know, the idea that, like, Software is the solution for everything. The, a state can sue a business on this based on the kind of issue that Mr. Brown mentioned about, like, are two businesses really related? Um, you know, that, that is not a software question. That's an application of the law question. That you, again, you're a small business in Idaho. You've got to fight that out in New York court. Uh, application as to whether or not the products you're selling fall into the categories that the software is saying that, or you said through the software they fell into, that would get litigated. The, all these litigation issues are, you know, the same thing Maggie was talking about from business activity tax. And that is states having the ability to go after the smallest businesses in other states. Those are the prime targets. Like, state tax collectors want to go after businesses that aren't going to sue them back. You know, that instead are going to respond to the letter with a check. And that is the way this kind of stuff works in, in, in the real world. Yeah, Bro, Mr. Brown, you mentioned a million dollar business. And just for clarity, having worked in that industry for years, building software, a, a million dollar business and purposes of this bill is really just a one or two person company. Because the, what is it, the margin you earn as a retailer saves a 20% margin. That would mean that you'd have maybe 200000 left to pay all of your bills, all of your marketing, all of your travel, all of your advertising, your accounting. And if there's anything left over to pay salaries, maybe you cover one or two people. So we shouldn't have the impression that a million dollars is a big company, especially not when Brian's company and Amazon will charge you 10 to 20% of your gross sales price as a commission for selling on their platform. 
So if you're only making 20% gross margin and you give all of that to Amazon or eBay, you don't have a lot left. And I think that that's the implication you have to think about. Is, is a million even close to being an appropriate threshold for the businesses in your state? Because you're going to hear about it. You and your boss will hear the phone ring off the hook that made it a small business, it makes a few sales into New York, or a few sales in Illinois, and suddenly has to collect there. Because this bill doesn't say a million of online, it says a million of total room of commerce, even if only a little bit of it's online. Do you want to respond to that? And maybe we can also, rather than have this be all of the internet sales tax, yeah, before other entries on the docket. Sure. Joe, why don't you have the last comment on that? Sure, I mean, I think the statistics I provided earlier, you know, there are only 7,500 e commerce sellers in America, according to economists that come and exceed a million. Um, no one's suggesting they're a business the same size of Amazon, but they're a substantial business. And we can argue about margins. I, I, I'm frankly not sure that I believe that 20% is the average margin for uh, gross margin for a retailer. Um, but uh, Brian brought up the issue of due process. I think it is important to talk about that because, uh, as all of you know, due process is not something that is amenable to congressional diminishment. Um, whatever this bill does, it does not diminish the due process clause because Congress doesn't have the authority to do that. Uh, the purposeful availment standard that the Supreme Court has set forth remains there, and if a seller uh, is not purposely availing the market, uh, then they would have a defense against that. I'd be happy to talk with any of you later about why I think litigation in that area is unlikely. It's probably uh, too much for the scope of this panel. Thank you. New question. Uh, back there, and then we'll come to you next, sir. I got a question on CASA. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Does that apply to individuals as well? For example, if there are individuals who may work in Tennessee, It does not, and I think that, that, that the issue you're talking about is more closely treated by the Mobile Workforce Bill, which is, doesn't have a representative on this panel. Why don't you explain that just for a few minutes, because it is an important issue. Joe might be better at that than I am. Okay. Um, the Council on State Taxation is the uh, prime proponent of the Mobile, um, Mobile Workforce Act, which uh, it just got reintroduced last week, and I can't remember the, the House number. I don't know if anybody has it. Something like that. Okay. Um, what it basically right now, when you travel to another war, another another state for business, um, that state has the right to impose tax on your income as it should. Um, however, some states don't have a threshold. So in other words, if you're there for a day, and New York's one of those, if you fly up to New York City for a meeting for a day, <coughs> technically you have a legal, legal liability to file a tax return in New York State at the end of the year. Um, what the bill does is just set a national threshold of 30 days, below which you would not be required to file a return in another state. Um, so if you travel to New York for 25 days of the year, and you travel to Montana for 12, you would file a return only in your home state. There's a negligible impact on state revenues because each state now provides a credit for taxes you pay to other, another state. So if you live in Virginia and you travel to New York for a certain number of days and you file a New York return, you deduct from your Virginia return and the taxes you pay to New York. There's some limitations on that, but again, beyond what we're talking about here. So that bill would say below 30 days, you don't have a liability in the other state, your taxes are all in your home state. So it's pretty much a watch. There, there are some variations in cost as a study that Ernst and Young put together that does the 50 state version of that. Now, I understand there's an exception for athletes and entertainers, is that correct? The, currently, yes. The, the, bill, the bill would um, would not provide the protections to athletes, entertainers, and certain public figures as defined in the bill. Uh, and again, I, I don't work on this issue. I just happen to have it in the past, so I, I know about it. Um, uh, and I have not read the current version, but I believe it's the same as the last version. And that's because the states have already uh, historically enforced personal income taxes against those classes of people because their schedules are generally published. And in fact, some states have bonded, um, for example, facility improvements and arenas associated with the activity with those tax revenues. And so there was a, a local bonding issue. And so those things were carved out for political purposes, not for any uh, principled reasons. And I was going to add, that's usually how we hear about it in the news. They usually the pop up job an tax. actor mm -hmm. came uh, for a couple of days to film something, a performer, and then there the job taxes as a team shows up. Every now and then you see articles in the paper on that. Um, yes, sir. Yeah, uh, speaking of the news, I wanted to ask whether any of these bills, uh, as uh, presently drafted, is meant to address the uh, litigation that's going on around the country with the travel consolidators 
and the amount on which they are meant to collect sales taxes or hotel motel taxes. I can take that one as an issue. I work for my member companies like Expedia. And uh, what you're speaking of is if you get a hotel room through an online travel service, they have a markup or fee that they charge for the purpose, you know, for the service of researching the room and booking it for you. And the question that a lot of local governments said is that we want to tax that at the same rate as the hotel tax in our town, which is 14 to 22 percent. So my colleagues are testifying in Nashville today because they want to impose Nashville's 14 and a half percent on the $10 fee you pay to Orbitz, even though you book the room while you're sitting in Virginia. So there's one element of this, the laws we've heard up here that would address that, and that is the sourcing element. Almost all the states that have embraced this streamlined sales tax have agreed that the source of a service is where the service is first used, and if you can't figure that out, it's the address and the billing address of the person who used it. So therein, if, uh, if I used Orbitz to book a hotel room in Nashville, I used the service of the booking and the research while I was sitting here in Virginia. That is my billing address. There's no way Nashville can tax it. So I think that one of the bills just touches it, the MFA. And we may see in this Congress, we may see an attempt to try to do a travel tax fairness bill. Of course, it's going to be called fairness, right? It'll be a travel tax fairness bill that would try to clarify that local, local lodging taxes apply only to the amounts received by the local lodging establishment. So in the example you just gave, if you were to book that hotel room in Nashville, Tennessee could still collect from Expedia a tax on the room, but Virginia would collect from Expedia the tax on Expedia's fee for booking the room? Exactly. If Virginia taxed the service. And you should know that all of the rooms you book at Expedia in order, they all remit the full tax to the hotel based on the full amount the hotel receives. That's never been an issue in any of the 70 lawsuits that I think you're thinking about. When you pay for a room on Orbitz or Expedia, the full hotel tax is handed to the hotel to pay on the amount the hotel received. Yes, sir. Gary Arlen. Uh, this is mainly I think from Mr. Del Pantor, uh, uh, Ms. Canning, and Dr. Atkinson, you may have a thought about too. Uh, digital goods and services, video on demand, TV everywhere, all these different ways to get entertainment digitally beyond just your audible.com uh, 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 music books you listen to. How does that fit together? Again, the ISP is related to the TV everywhere issue, obviously. Other services like Crackle or YouTube, Netflix, etc. Are they going to fit into this anywhere? State tax collectors are likely to fit in everywhere, right? Subjected to the 18% of uh, wireless tax if I download it wirelessly, you know, go to sales tax on and make it part of the local bill. And uh, keep in mind that the franchise capability, most local local governments in the United States uh, treat it as if there's a franchise right to serve video to their citizens. And that's why they're able to impose a franchise tax for just serving video of any kind. And uh, that is a, not the, no, no, not the content, but the, the notion of, of serving up at a streaming service to you. So, and Annabelle, do you have anything particular on that? Well, I think, um what, what happens in the, it, you kind of look to the bill and how the, what the consumer is paying for in the bill and who they're purchasing it from. So um, what, what happens is the, the, um, both the digital goods bill and the internet, access, internet tax moratorium do have definitions. So internet access only includes actually the access. So if a consumer separately purchases downloaded video, a movie, and they're going to pay um, the, the cable company or the phone company for that movie, that is treated separately from the internet connection that's maybe come over. Um, the video then is subject to tax in a state. If the state taxes video services, some states do under sales tax, is subject to that sales tax. And um, if it's delivered as part of the video product, it may be subject to cable video type fees uh, in a jurisdiction as well. Yeah. Well, I, I would simply add that, that to the extent it's sold by a, a not affiliated third party, a Netflix or somebody that's not associated with the carrier, for instance, the tax man shouldn't care if it's downloaded video or a downloaded book or a downloaded song. It's just bits. And so it's, it's some good sold at a price. Does the tax apply? If so, where does it apply? That's what ought to matter, not, what, not what's in the digital package. I, uh, one more um, point. Uh, clarification is um, there the internet tax moratorium does provide protection in the event that it's um, 
for instance, downloaded music. If the downloaded music appears on your phone bill, you can't impose some sort of communications tax on that. It protects from um, being taxed because that same download could be purchased from some other company that's not subject to some sort of special communications tax. So that's you know, one of the critical provisions in the internet war frame. And keep in mind that a number of telecom companies had to litigate this in the state of Montana because they claim that uh, Montana doesn't have a sales tax, but they have a pretty hefty telecom tax. And they were imposing the telecom tax if you downloaded a ringtone or a game on a, on a mobile device. Well, that went to court and Montana lost. Right, the court held that under the internet tax moratorium, the telecommunications tax that exists in Montana state with no sales tax could not be applied. But it's very expensive to go to court, and it took a couple of years, and this is one of the reasons that you and your bosses need to clarify this with something like the Digital Goods and Services Fairness Tax. I would say, well, I think this is going to be a growing issue because as we, as, as we essentially, eventually we'll move to pretty much all over the top video. It might take 40 years, but that's where the world is going to go. And the real question is, in that interim transition, are we going to tax your video bits if you get it not over the top at a real, real high rate and not tax the other video bits at a low rate or no rate? Essentially, we're going to have to figure out how to make that non-discriminatory. So we need another fairness act. Oh, there you go. Fairness act. Fairness act. Fairness act. In front of the video. In front of tax lawyers, we know that the next iteration will be if people start packaging this stuff routinely. Why do we have certain things separated out on the bill when it shouldn't be the telecom fights that we had on taxes 15 years ago? So we'll be back out there. My kids, I'll be able to teach my kids how to, how to work on tax issues. Yes, ma'am. Um, so keeping with digital goods, um, we look at the state and they're trying to tax digital goods, digital services. They don't really distinguish between a digital good or a digital service. At the federal level, are we clarifying that if I use Spotify or Pandora, that's different from buying a song from iTunes? Yeah, the, the digital goods fairness, digital goods and services fairness tax has separate definitions of digital goods and services. Mm -hmm. But the provisions of the bill, which are sourcing, only in the billing address, mm -hmm. non-discrimination, and that the legislature has to enact the tax. What this bill does is it forces those requirements on there. And it protects a business, the business collected the tax based on your billing address. But remember, states are free to do crazy things like enact brand new taxes on things that they would otherwise like to encourage, and they will do that. Okay, let's do one more question, then we're going to go down and have everyone uh, give me the name of the legislation or the likely name of passing the legislation, where things stand right now, so that folks can go back to the know right where uh, they can find more information on the legislation. Uh, any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Andrew Moyler from the R3 Institute. Um, this is mostly for Joe. We've talked about this a little bit before, but I wanted to ask about the Marketplace Fairness Act. One of the things that it purports to do is to level the playing field between brick and mortar uh, and online sales. And it, it seems to me that what the bill does is actually the opposite of that, because it's requiring a different collection standard for remote retail sales than exists for brick and mortar sales. So if I walk down to the gift shop in the basement here, and purchase something, they don't ask me where I live and say, okay, I'll charge you Virginia tax on that. They charge me the Washington, D.C. sales tax for it. Uh, it effectively operates on an origin sourcing rule. And what this bill does is the opposite of that for remote retail sales. It says that they do have to quiz everybody about where they live. So uh, why is it that having a different collection standard like that for those two different types of sales uh, is something that, that falls under fairness? And why is it that some of the proponents wouldn't be okay with uh, having a uniform sourcing rule for everybody, whether it's origin-based sourcing or destination, you know, take your pick, but uh, but nobody's advocating that. So there, there are several different questions in there, so I know we don't have a lot of time, I'll try to unpack it quickly, Martin, so that we can get through. Um, I have a different perspective than you do, although I agree with the same conclusion that the bill does treat remote sellers differently than brick and mortar sellers. It provides them protections that brick and mortar sellers don't receive. So many of the simplifications and protections of the bill are exclusively provided to remote sellers, so I think it puts them in some ways in a better situation. What you're comparing in my mind are apples and oranges. You're comparing transactions that occur at a counter and then transactions that occur uh, at a distance, remote sales. Remote sales would all be treated the same way, and that's the same way it is right now. All interstate sales are sourced on a destination basis right now. No state sources interstate sales on an origin basis. 
So interstate sales, which is all the bill addresses, because by definition the Commerce Clause is restricted to interstate, not intrastate activity. All interstate sales are treated the same way by states. The bill continues to treat them exactly the way they are right now, which is on a destination basis. The discussion of origin sourcing, again, is something that I'd be happy to have, but probably uh, beyond the 10 minutes we have remaining. So I'll be around if anybody wants to talk about that exciting topic as well. Or, or tune in on Thursday. Where we'll be able to get into these questions. Uh, right. the, the three of us know. and Emmett back yeah. there are going to discuss this for just it for an hour and a half. I'm happy, <laughs> happy, to, happy to reprise this and more. And to make a quick plug, uh, of which several of us have been on the board or still on the board of the Internet Education Foundation, the event is actually I don't remember. Where do you guys remember the room number of where we are? It's somewhere up here on the half side. Uh, so it's the Internet Caucus Advisory Group is holding um, just a discussion on internet sales tax. I'm moderating, and we have uh, the middle three plus uh, Emmett back there who will be joining us, so we're kind of traveling the roadshow on that, that topic. And that's noon in Rayburn 2237. Thank you, sir. All right, uh, we might have time for one quick question, and then I want to go down and give you guys the recap. Anybody? Okay, great. So, Annabelle, let's we'll start with uh, the name of legislation or proposed name of legislation if it's not introduced yet. Um, and where it stands in this Congress, and in your case, when the current moratorium expires? Uh, yes, the um, name of the legislation is the Permanent Internet Tax Freedom Act of 2013. Bills have been introduced in both the House and the Senate. Senate Bill is S31, um, sponsored by Senator Ayotte and Senator Heller. Um, in the House, um, the bill is HR 434. Or, 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 Four, and it's by Representative Shabbat. Um, and the internet moratorium um, is due to expire November 1st of 2014. Wow, that's interesting, right before elections. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> Joe? Uh, the bill is the Marketplace Fairness Act of 2013. Identical versions have been introduced in the House and the Senate. The House bill is H-684, and the Senate is S-336. There's a bipartisan list of co-sponsors for each bill, uh, and the sponsors and proponents are working diligently uh, for action, uh, potentially soon, in the Senate. Okay, Brian, do you have anything No, that was factually accurate. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Steve? Right. The Digital Goods and Services Tax Fairness Act, it'll presumably be of 2013. In 2011, we had Senators Wyden and Thune, and in the House, we had Representatives Smith, Cohen, Coble, and Hastings. Uh, the Digital Goods Fairness Coalition is working on some tweaks to accommodate concerns, technical concerns, of state and local tax administrators with respect to what happens to taxes that have been enacted in the past and maybe not validated by judges. So a handful of technical um, corrections are coming, but we should see the bill this spring. Uh, ours is the Business Activity Tax Simplification Act. The lead co-sponsors in the House would be Representatives Goodlatte and Bobby Scott. Um, we expect introduction this spring. And the language uh, we expect to be identical to the bills introduced in the last Congress, a copy of which is on the table out in the hallway. The uh, Wireless Tax Fairness Act should be forthcoming in the April-May work period. The sponsors over here on the House side will be Congresswoman Lofgren and Congressman Franks. And on the Senate, again, uh, Senator Wyden is working. So I will just uh, conclude my comments from back to Rob uh, with a thanks. Uh, thank you to the panel. Uh, without you guys, we would have had zero content. Um, although Rob and I can get up and chat with it. Uh, it's nice to have you all join us. Uh, my greatest thanks are reserved for the audience. Thank you for coming. Uh, without having you here, there would be no point for all of us to get together and have a lunch together on uh, tax policy. Thank you very much. Thank you to IIF for uh, working with us so wonderfully. I very much appreciate it, Rob. Thank you. All right. Thank you.